Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video, I will discuss microbial genetics and DNA extraction via freestyle cell license. This is the ninth in the series of 10 lab sessions held as part of my Laboratory for the Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you are a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include learning about the structure and function of DNA, understanding the process of in vivo DNA replication, performing DNA extraction and purification for your unknown bacterial specimen, and as always, understanding your safety and disposal procedures. The building blocks of nucleic acids are nucleotides, each of which contains a pentose sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. Deoxyribonucleotides within DNA contain deoxyribose as the pentose sugar, and DNA contains the pyrimidines, cytosine and thymine, and the purines, adenine and guanine. Nucleotides are linked together by phosphodiester bonds between the 5' prime phosphate group of one nucleotide and the 3' prime hydroxyl group of another nucleotide. A nucleic acid strand has a free phosphate group at the 5' prime end and a free hydroxyl group at the 3'. Prime end. So when you're talking about structure of DNA, so that was your basic rundown, you want to talk about some of the history. Rosalind Franklin, shown here, she used an x-ray diffraction method in order to understand the structure of DNA way back in 1952. It was Rosalind Franklin's scientific expertise that resulted in the production of a well-defined image that clearly showed DNA's double helix. Watson and Crick, those are the ones that you guys have heard of, um, they described the DNA molecule using Franklin's X-ray diffraction, and uh, they proposed that DNA was made up of two strands that are twisted around each other to form a right-handed helix, and that the two DNA strands were anti-parallel, such that the three prime end of one strand is facing the five prime end of the other strand. And then and that was in 1953, so that was a year after uh, Rosalind Franklin's DNA X-ray photo. Australian, biochemi Australian biochemist Erwin Shargaff, he examined the content of DNA in different species and he found that the amount of adenine was always really close to equaling the amount of thymine, and the amount of cytine, cytosine was really close to the same amount as guanine. So this ended up with Shargaff's rules, which is adenine only binds with thymine, and cytosine only binds with guanine. So this is the x-ray diffraction pattern of DNA. This is known as photo 51. This is Rosalind Franklin's photo that shows the helical nature of DNA. Um, analysis of this diffraction pattern determined that there are approximately 10 base pairs per turn in DNA and that the asymmetrical spacing of the sugar phosphate backbones generates a major groove where the backbone is far apart and a minor groove where the backbone is close together. The nitrogenous bases, adenine and guanine, these are the purines, and they have a double ring structure. So these, these guys here. A way to remember this is that the larger structure has a smaller name. The smaller structure has a larger name. So your purines are larger, and they have a double ring structure with, six, with a six carbon ring fused to a five carbon ring. So for adenine, for example, this is your six carbon ring and five carbon ring. The purines over here on the left are your cytosine and thymine. They are smaller than, per, than purines. The pyrimidines, cytosine and thymine, are smaller than the purines, and they only they consist of just one six carbon ring structure. The three components of a deoxyribonucleotide, the three components of a deoxyribonucleotide are a five-carbon ring 
sugar, this here, your deoxyribose sugar, a phosphate group that's shown here, and then one of your purines or pyrimidines. In this case, this is the purine adenine. In order to be called a deoxyribonucleotide, it has to have all three of those structures. And this is responsible for complementary base pairing between nucleic acid strands. The five carbons of deoxyribose are 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, and then 5 prime. Phosphodiester bonds between nucleotide between the nucleotides forms the phosphate sugar backbone. So when it said phosphate sugar backbone, it's these phosphate groups here and then the sugars here. That forms the backbones of your DNA. Hydrogen bonds are formed in the middle. These hold the nucleotides together. Now here you have your sugar phosphate backbone, and on the inside you have your A's and T's and G's and C's. Those are held together by relatively weak hydrogen bonds. The sugar phosphate backbones are on the outside of the double helix, and the purines, pyrimidines, form the rungs of the DNA helix ladder. So this is just another way, these are all just another way of looking at what we just saw on the last slide. The direction of each strand is identified by numbering the carbons, one through five, in each sugar molecule. So the five prime end is here because it ends on the fifth carbon in this ring. The three prime end is here because it ends in the third carbon on this ring. The three prime end has the hydroxyl group. So that's going to be important later if you're doing uh, DNA replication or amplification. This three prime carbon would be where the next nucleotide can add, this hydroxyl group right here. The four cells can divide. They have to double their cell structures. They have to double their organelles and all of their genetic information. And this is done via DNA replication. When we say in vivo DNA replication, in vivo means that this is done in nature. This is a natural process that's happening in your body right now. A double-stranded DNA molecule separates along its weak, a relatively weak hydrogen bonds between the base pairs, between the purines and pyrimidines in the middle. It unzips, and then free nucleotides that are present in the nucleus then start to attach themselves to the now kind of exposed nucleotides, and they do it by complementary base pairing. So adenine will bind to a thymine only. A thymine will only bind to an adenine. A cytosine will only bind to a guanine. Guanine will only bind to a cytosine. And then what you end up with is two identical strands of DNA. Uh, this link down here at the bottom shows a nice, it's a nice uh, simulation of in vivo DNA replication. <clears throat> so if you want to, you can go and check that out. I put all of these here. I want you to become very familiar with the following enzymes and their roles in in vivo DNA replication. We're going to review in class in much more detail what all of these enzymes do in vivo, and we're actually going to compare what the enzymes do in vivo to what we can then do in in vitro processes. Uh, we'll talk about that really kind of specifically during lab 10. Several different methods that are commonly used to extract DNA from uh, specimen. So some of your chemical methods include detergents like SDS and CTAB. You have enzymes, uh, lysozyme, proteinase K. You can also use osmotic shock. Uh, some of your physical methods include using beads, um, liquid homogenization, grinding, and sonication. We're actually going to use is freestyle cell lysis. In freestyle cell lysis, the cell membranes are ruptured in order to release their DNA. We can use freestyle cell, freestyle cell lysis in bacteria because their cell walls are relatively fragile, and it's pretty easy to, to get them to lyse. In this image just shows some intact cells here. It's a cell that has been lysed. So it's kind of just like popping a bubble. Once you lyse that cell membrane or that cell wall, it spits everything out. And then all you have to do is get the DNA and separate it from all of the other stuff that's in there. You're going to freeze your cell suspension. So you're going to get some of your broth and put it in a microcentrifuge tubes, these little bitty tubes. 
and you freeze it in dry ice, you thaw it in a hot water bath, and you do this multiple times. And while you do that, the cell walls, they swell and they shrink and they sell, swell and they shrink. They form crystals and eventually they will break and lice and burst open. And then you also use a little bit of liquid homogenization. So you homogenize your sample using a vortex. This is all just fancy ways of saying that you mix it up really good. The equipment that you use to do that is called a vortex. In order to separate the, the DNA from the other stuff in there that you don't want, you spin it using a centrifuge. And the centrifuge will separate any kind of solid from liquid. Your lice cells are going to release DNA, proteins, kinases, other intracellular materials. We centrifuge it, and then there's also going to be another purification step after we finish the extraction to get all of that stuff you don't want out of there. As usual, you're going to go through your safety guidelines. One thing that I really, really want to make very clear before you come to this lab is that you are working with dry ice. Dry ice is, it can be quite dangerous. It is very cold. It's actually cold enough that it can burn you if you touch it, which sounds weird, but it's true. It can freeze the cells in your fingers and it causes it to burn. So I'll show you how to um, protect yourself from that. We're gonna use either thermal gloves or you can use forceps or clothespins so that you're not touching the dry ice. Also, uh, dry ice releases carbon dioxide gas it's harmless as long as it's mixing with enough oxygen, but if you have your face really, really close to a whole bunch of dry ice, you can actually be deprived of oxygen. So you want to be careful with working with that. Some observation and interpretations. So you want to make sure that you know and understand Chargaff rules, how DNA uh, is put together, what binds with what, what's appearing, what's a pyrimidine. Make sure you understand the relative strengths and weaknesses of the phosphodiester bonds and the hydrogen bonds. You want to make sure you know which enzymes pull, which enzyme pulls DNA apart, which enzyme makes RNA primers, which enzyme adds new uh, nucleotides to the parent strand, and which enzyme joins together Okazaki fragments. And then for the method itself, the procedure itself, why is this sufficient for extracting DNA from bacteria? Make sure you can explain that. What's the purpose of vortexing and centrif centrifuging in this procedure? Once the DNA is extracted, I'm going to do some of the work outside of class because we only have one sequencer, supplies are limited, and it's just the nature of the beast. Um, because I need to combine the DNA specimen across sections. So I'm going to combine like specimen across sections, and what that will do is it will increase the concentration of DNA. Then I will, I will purify each specimen using a process called ethanol precipitation. So uh, what that does is it gets any of those extra, any of the kinases and proteins and stuff that we missed, get all of that out of there, make your DNA nice and pure. Then I'll subject the DNA to gel electrophoresis, and I'll put that image on Moodle. Uh, I will explain in lab what the image is telling you, but in short here, of what you'll see is DNA bands, and you'll see a marker ladder, and you'll be able to see from the gel image if your DNA was concentrated, if it was pure, if it was there at all. If the concentration of your DNA is low, then I will go ahead and amplify the DNA using PCR. And then finally, I will sequence the DNA, and I'll post those sequences to Moodle, and then we'll discuss in lab 10 how all of this stuff works, what to do with the sequences, uh, how to query your sequences, and all that stuff. So thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description below for more videos related to these topics. And leave your questions for me in the comments below.